Good morning, junior paleontologists. We are so glad you've joined us again on this Tuesday. And it's amazing that April is almost over, but we are making it through. And this has been a good opportunity for us to film these tours of the museum. And we're glad you're with us. Hopefully you're able to fill out your junior paleontology sheet. And we'll be working on that as we go through the rest of the museum. We're going to hopefully spend the next uh, couple, three times on the rest of the museum. We might even have a special guest coming up. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of keep you updated on what's happening because it looks like maybe we'll be able to open sometime soon. So at that point, we'll have to focus on getting the museum open, and we want to invite you to come see us when we do uh, open. So once again, we're glad you're here to join us today on this Tuesday, and we are starting our tour where we finished off on Friday night. How many of you were with us on Friday night? Yeah, I think there was quite a few of you that, that watched our night at the museum. Alden did a great job of leading us through the museum in the dark, and it was quite a fun, interesting way to see the museum instead of with all the lights on and everything. So we're starting here in the dig room. This We actually camped out in here all night. We slept in here and and had a great time. We had pizza and did all sorts of things on, on Friday night. So it was a lot of fun. But our dig room is here to kind of show you what a dig site can potentially be like. Now we know that it's inside. It's not, it's not a perfect representation of what a dig site is like because we're not having to deal with heat and bugs and all of those kinds of things. But we have a lot of stuff that we are able to show people. And, and one of those, and we'll just kind of quickly go through this, is how to find bones out on a dig site. The first thing is, is you just find an area that might have dinosaur bones or fossils, and you just start walking around and looking. And a lot of times, it just takes practice, lots and lots of practice. If you talk to Tommy and Martha and Otis, they would tell you that that it really takes getting out and learning the difference between a bone and a rock. And I'm going to sneak in here really quick, and I'm going to pull up a piece. And if you can see this, I'll just hold it there, and you can kind of zoom in. This is a piece of bone. And you can see inside the bony material inside, and then the, this is the outside surface of the bone. And as Tommy said in his presentation, one way you can tell is by licking the bone or getting your finger wet and, and sticking it to the bone because there's all these little pores in the bone, and that's why it'll, it'll sometimes stick. It doesn't always work, but it is one way to kind of tell maybe whether you have bone or, or a rock. But just being able to look at it and see, you can see that surface of the bone right there. So one of the things to do is to walk around and look for bone and to look for pieces of bone. And that's the search. We look for things called float. And float are those little pieces of bone that have, have eroded out of the hills that then we begin to try to trace back up to their source if we can. And if you want to kind of look right up here, right at this spot right here, see that is a bone that's still in the hillside. And that particular bone, uh, you can see the broken end of it. Maybe that piece is down at the bottom and you found it. And so you started looking up and then you found that bone sticking out of the hillside. Uh, my friend Bob Brown, who works at a camp over by uh, Absurky, Montana, he found a, um, I think it was a toe bone just sticking out of the, sticking out of the hill. And it was pretty cool. He said, what's this? And I looked at it and it was like, whoa, that's a, that's a pretty cool toe bone. So we've been able to find a lot of things just sticking out of the hillside. Now, if you find a bigger bone, it might become a bigger dig site. And that's right over here. We have some information on the dig beginning. And I actually think that there's some questions about this on the junior paleontology sheet. So I'm going to see if I can find Alden because... Uh, I think he was he was off exploring somewhere else in the museum when we got started and and I'm going to call him and see if he can come in here and he can start helping us through the junior paleontology sheet. Alden, are you here? Alden, where are you at? I'm here. Oh, here he is. Hey, come on up, Alden. Come on up and let's stand right here and let's look. Here's Alden. 
and he is working on the the upstairs page of the junior paleontology sheet and I want to start yeah go ahead and show that to everybody and we've got some matching to do upstairs and then if we can take a look at it we've got some other questions too um, we're gonna skip the first question that talks about the featured dinosaur but let's go to what do you think a paleontologist does so Alden would you tell us what you think a paleontologist does they dig up dinosaur bones. That is one thing that paleontologists do, dig up dinosaur bones. And you can write that on your sheet. Paleontologists also look for fossils in general, so not just dinosaur bones. But that's what a lot of people really like to do. So um, that's so you can write that down on your sheet. What's the next question? Name three tools a paleontologist uses to dig for fossils. What are some things, and so let's look around here right now. What are things that you see that a paleontologist could use to dig for fossils? What about that one right there? A screwdriver? Yeah, a screwdriver. We use, we use old screwdrivers. Isn't that crazy that that's one of the things we use? Um, let's see here. Let's go around. Let's go this way, and you can kind of see some of the different things. Um, here's a, an old ice cream bucket, right? There's an ice cream bucket back there. And what's this? A hammer. A hammer. We use hammers because sometimes we have to break through the ground and the screwdriver helps us dig in the ground. Uh, what is that back there? Can you see that pickaxe. back there? A pickaxe. Yeah, that's a pickaxe. We use those too because sometimes we have to remove a lot of dirt to get down to the layers of the bones. Let's go back over this way and let's see if we can find some other stuff. You know, what do we use to uh, kind of move the dirt away? A uh, brush, like a yeah, paint brush. Yeah, we use paint brushes. That's true. Um, we use, oh, what are these? Come here. Do you know what that is? No, I don't know what that is. It's a, if you've ever been to the dentist, it's a dental pick. And we use dental picks when you get down and you start having to remove little bits of dirt around the fossil as well. And so you can write any of those answers down. So there's a paintbrush, we got hammers, we got screwdrivers, we got uh, buckets. And we'll talk a little bit more about what we use the buckets for and, and all of that in just a second. But when you find a spot that you can begin to start working on a bigger find, then the real work begins. That's when you start having to really dig in there and use your pickaxe and use your uh, shovels and your hammers and all that kind of stuff and it's a lot of work a lot of people think it's just like uh, Jurassic Park where you'd go and you just brush some dirt off and boom there's a dinosaur but that's not the way it is it's a lot of work now in this exhibit there's a question right here right under the pictures do you want to read that question uh, right here in the dig room what is the featured dinosaur's name yep don't read the rest of it just because we're not going to watch the video but what do you know what the name of this dinosaur is so let me just go through some of the bones before you answer okay we have this this is the real frill of a triceratops kind of creature and this is the real thing here let's look over here this is a brow horn and this is a nose horn can you get that one too this is the nose horn and all these come from the same dinosaur. We have 50% of this dinosaur that we own, and we want to get it on display someday, but we're still in the process of working on it. So we've displayed a few pieces of that dinosaur in this room. What's what do we name what what have we named him? What is he called? Big John. Big John. Yeah, he's pretty cool. He's he's massive. If you remember the triceratops downstairs, that triceratops is a lot smaller than Big John. Big John's 50% larger so than that, than that Triceratops. So that's pretty cool. So as we begin to work on a dig site, we have to prepare bigger bones for removal. Do you know, what do we wrap? What do we first wrap the bone in? So we dig around the bone, and you can kind of see that right here. So go ahead and stay on this sign. We dig around the bone and kind of underneath of it there a little bit and kind of uh, get it on a little bit of a pedestal. And then we cover it in... Foil. 
Yes, we cover it in foil, and that kind of holds it all together. And then we take, like, gunny sacks or burlap, and we soak them in plaster, and then we put that over the top. And that's, you can see that really good right here. That's a plaster-covered bone. And if you look at the sign again, can you go up to the sign one more time? We'll kind of show you what we do. There we go. We are right here. So see, there's the, there's the foil and the plaster, and we dig under it, and then we break it loose. We break it loose from this pedestal, and we flip it over. So anytime you see a dinosaur bone that has the bone showing uh, on the, you know, if you're in a museum and you see it just like this, just like this bone right here, that is upside down from the way it was in the ground because this was sitting on a pedestal of dirt. And we were able to break that loose and flip that bone over and get that bone out. I remember helping Otis work on this bone right here. Isn't that pretty cool? Mm -hmm. It's a pretty neat, it's a pretty neat find. So that is some of the things we do. We then take that back to the uh, back to the lab and we begin to work on it, begin to clean it up, put it back together again, especially if it's broken up into pieces. And you can kind of see another example of a of a dig site if you kind of look down here. I know it might be kind of difficult to see down there. Do you want to kind of kneel down there, Alden, and show show everybody that particular scene? It's pretty cool. It shows you a little bit about it. Now, there's one thing about all these knee highs, and if you ever come to the museum, we're not going to show you every one of them, but if you come to the museum, you can look for snakes. Can you find the snake in that one, Alden? Right there by the bucket. Oh, way back, back there by the bucket. Can you see that over there? Yeah, there we go. There's the snake in that one. So you can add that to your snake count. And again, like I said, we're not going to hit every snake, not even close, because we want to leave you some things to do when you come to the museum. So let's go ahead and um, keep kind of going through our dig room a little bit. And one of the things I want to hit on is right here, we find dinosaur bones in Glendive because we live on the edge of what's called an anticline. So it's where the layers have been pushed up and then they get eroded away and expose the layers down deeper. So you can see that right here in this picture. And then if you look at the map over here, you can see Glendive right there. If you can see that, there's Glendive. And we're on the edge of this anticline. That's what this is right here. And that's why we find dinosaur bones here. There's reasons other places, but that is why we find them here in Glendive. So let's make our way out of the dig room. And let's kind of walk through here and let's see if we can get over to the to the Bible room, which is our next, which is our next room. So um, Alden, why don't you lead us? Why don't you go ahead and lead us into the Bible room? So go ahead. Actually, let's stop right here, right before the Bible room. Look at this stuff. Why don't you go up and look at it? So in here, we have a variety of things that we find on our dig site. Can you tell us what some of them are, buddy? Um, palm fruit. Palm fruit. Did you know we find palm trees when we were out digging? Yeah. Do we have palm trees now? No. In Glendive? Not, not in Glendive, right? <laughs> we are not a tropical paradise, are we? <laughs> what kind of trees grow in Glendive? Uh, Very few. Yeah. <laughs> not many at all. Did you know we find sequoia cones? Isn't that cool? There's all sorts of things. What are those, Alden? Gar scales. Garfish scales. There's garfish still around, and people catch them in the river and stuff, and down south they catch them a lot. And we find garfish scales, uh, crocodile and alligator scoot. We already talked about that, which is the armor. The scoots are the armor on the outside of the uh, crocodile or alligator. All sorts of different teeth. We find mammals, and we find dinosaur bones as well. So we find a variety of things in our, on our dig site and around our area, a bunch of different stuff. And we think it fits the flood because we think the flood mixed all this stuff up and brought all this stuff and buried it right, uh, right there where we're, where we dig here in Glendive. So that's pretty cool. 
All right, so we're going to go into the Otis and Miriam Klein Biblical History Exhibit, and we're going to talk about that, and we're going to kind of make our way over there, and I think we will end in the Biblical History Exhibit. So come on in. And I want to just talk about a couple things in here, because this honestly is one of the most important exhibits in the museum. Because we are a museum that presents our exhibits in the context of biblical history, we want people to understand that they can trust the Bible. When the Bible talks about history, can you trust it? Mm, yeah. Yes, that's right. What if it talks about something scientific? Can you trust it? Yes. Yes. What if it talks about something about God? Is it true? Yeah. Yeah, it is. So all of those things are true, and we want people to know that they can trust the Bible. That the Bible it has been around for a long time, and the people that wrote it were inspired by God to write the truth of what happened at the beginning of the world all the way up until now. And so that we can know how to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, right? It's very important. This is a 1611 King James Bible. It's my favorite thing here in the museum. So this one is from 1611. It was the 1611 King James Bible was written in 1611, published in 1611, and this one comes from that year. So it's very, very cool. So when you come to the museum, I want you to just come in this room and just take a look at all the different Bibles and show, we, we try to show that the Bible is accurate and his May has stayed accurate throughout history. So come on over here, Alden, and we want to kind of talk about one more thing here in our biblical history room. And that is, let's go over this way. Come over here. And uh, let's, I, I, yeah, I want to see, let's, let's have Alden stand up against this bone right here. There we go. How's that? So there's a question on your sheet. That says, what's that, that question right there? Name one bone in the biblical history room. Name one bone in the biblical history room. So what is this bone? Do you know, Alden? No. It is an Argentinosaurus vertebrae. Where's your vertebrae? It's your back. The little bones in your back. And we all have a lot of those bones that go down our spine. And this particular bone comes from an Argentinosaurus. And if you look at the sign above, you can see right there. See that red spot right there? That is this bone that we have right here. And that's how big that dinosaur would, would be. That is huge. Look how much bigger than our museum it is. And we want to illustrate that there are creatures that are just massive, and we think they're actually talked about in the Bible. Because some people say, well, why don't we see the word dinosaur in the Bible? Because the word dinosaur wasn't even invented until 1841, I think it was. And once it was invented, then we begin to see that word dinosaur used in history and, and, and in other things that people talked about, these creatures that had existed and before that, we think there was other names people used, dragon. And in the, in the Bible, we see the word behemoth in the book of Job, which talks about this massive creature that existed. And some people think it's an elephant or something else, but we think it's a dinosaur. We think that it is the behemoth is something like an Argentinosaurus because it fits the description. So go to Job chapter 40 and read that sometime and see what you think. See if what you think that that uh, dinosaur is, is being talked about. So we're going to wrap up this episode. Let's come stand over here again and, and let's just let people know kind of what's going on. Remember to keep filling out your form and and we're going to do the matching. We'll get most of that done next episode. And we'll make it around the museum. It'll be a little more of a, a whirlwind. There's a lot in this particular section. There's a lot out in the museum itself. But, but we'll do some of this matching a little more quickly. But we answered several questions for you here. And I hope you're able to keep up on that. Next time, we will continue through this junior paleontology sheet and then we'll also let you know how you can earn a button as well so thanks again for joining us come see us on thursday at 11 a.m 
And we thank you for being here on this Tuesday. Goodbye, everybody.